we record it. So, well, good evening, good evening, everyone. And you know, as they join, um, you know, we'll add those into the conversation. But hopefully, you're on the right call today. I know it's probably a busy day for a lot of people going on. So, if this is your last call, congratulations to you. I get how that goes for uh, for the type of work that we do here. But today, we're going to talk about EDI and recess and physical activity. And just have a, a, a thorough, a further conversation about lessons learned and maybe some alternative approaches that um, we can use on multiple levels and, and multiple sectors that we're in. And so um, as we get it started, I would love to hear backgrounds here. So I'm going to have, you know, Jess is going to share, uh, our director here, Karen Grimes is actually here. Jess, she's going to share just a quick poll. Um, but before we go there, I will go into so my name, a background, my name is Sterling Saban. Um, I am the Healthy Schools Manager I'm at Karen Goddard's, which is an educational consultant firm that is actually out of Kentucky, um, but I am located in South Carolina, and I have a background in public health from epidemiology to my last role was working um, in suicide prevention um, as an outreach coordinator for the state of South Carolina and doing what we we're calling trauma-informed suicide prevention. And kind of my in intersectionality of working with youth and especially with school communities is uh, I run a nonprofit um, in my community. Um, that focuses on using things like sports to divide, to provide further exposure, um, interactions, activities, and social emotional learning, um, self actualization, all those type of things when it comes to working with our youth. And so, um, and I'm a I'm a son of, of a, a mother who's still in um, in education herself. She's actually a special education um, coordinator for our district. So I'm always I've always been around that environment and still um, love to work with our youth. And so I'll have Jess introduce herself as well. I know she's out in the West Coast um, this week, but I definitely wanna, want you all to hear from Jess. Thanks, Sterling. Hi, Stephanie and Bob. We have a small intimate group of like friends, it. obviously. Um, we did have about 30 register, but you never know. So we'll record and throw this out into the universe, which is always great. Um, and I will be on for a little bit before I have to hop off and facilitate something this evening in Portland. Um, so uh, Jess Lawrence, Director of Care and Guidance, former middle school health teacher, formerly with the Oregon Department of Ed and now living in Kentucky. Um, and transferring to just a welcome since we just have a couple of you. Um, will you both just say hi and your role and where you are, we know you, but <laughs> it'd be great to hear. Bob, go ahead. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on when and where you're watching this. Sure. Um, I'm Bob Knight, Dr. Bob Knight from so Southern Connecticut State University, I'm an assistant professor here and physical education teacher education. I'm also here representing Shape of America's Physical Activity Council today, um, who helped publish a paper in regards to what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, hi, I'm Stephanie Bungie. I'm a project director for our Healthy School CDC Cooperative Agreement um, at the Kentucky Department of Education. Great, thank you all. Like I said, intimate group, but you are all the individuals we either worked with before or I myself have even gotten some insight and further um, development as well when it comes to the specific to this topic. And so I'm glad that y'all are able to join. And so just our, our objectives today um, on this brief call is this opportunity to engage in language and beliefs around equity um, or equity and inclusion and in recess and physical activity, maybe sharpen our understanding of the disparities in the systems uh, faced by our students. Uh, and be able to present implement, and implement alternatives to using recess and physical activity as punishments. And so, um, like I said, this will, will be a great just a dialogue here, even conversation. And so um, you all are already experts of your own kind of communities um, and the work that you do as well. And so as we kind of dive into what it means to create an environment, uh, which um, DEI and diversity, equity, inclusion is something that is important and not only important, like that's just the cornerstone of your culture. Um, I think it's important to talk about agreements. And so um, these agreements, I had an opportunity to be in Portland actually a couple of weeks ago, and we worked with the and do do a do a training with the Center of Equity and Inclusion, and they talk a lot about the agreements um, that they create in their um, in their environments that they work with, um, whether it's classroom environments, organizations, or working with youth in general. And so you know, um, as we're having these conversations, mostly in our school communities or or on a higher level, government sectors or district levels, um, 
you know, being able to employ that, staying engaged, um, we all know we can do that. And that's a tougher thing um, with all that's going on in our lives. But being able to speak your truth responsibly is pretty important when it comes to this conversation. Um, listen to understand. Um, being willing to do things differently and express discomfort. Um, expect and accept non-closure. So like today, even though we're going to have a great conversation and learn a lot, we understand that we're not going to solve what that the, the whole entire issue in this setting. And so sometimes being okay of saying, hey, this is going to be a, when we're going to, when we're going to talk about DEI in our schools or at a district level, this is not just a series. This is just kind of part of what we do as a community or an organization. And of course, it's confidentiality. So creating an environment which um, once you have these conversations that may be tough, uh, we feel like it's a safe area that it won't leak out or, or go somewhere that could be damaging. And, and, you know, I learned a lot when it comes to speak your truth responsibly, especially in this field where um, we might not have as much professional development in when it comes to employing DEI into our schools, you know. And so something I learned is like if you don't necessarily agree with that conversation, what's going on, you know, along with um, learning things like bias busters, which we might talk about, but being able to just to say thank you for speaking your truth responsibly. And that might be a cue of just saying, I might not agree, but thank you for just employing this conversation. And so being able to have these agreements and then learning how to tailor agreements with our youth, especially in the school communities for educators would be, um, I think, a, another alternative to uh, to discipline as well, because it, it's prevention. It's prevention work. Um, and so we're going to uh, transition. Uh, we're going to watch a video, but I want to skip the video today just because I think I think we understand maybe the makeup, um, but in that video, it talks about Darius, um, who I was explaining what happens. Darius uh, uh, was put on an IE plan, a IEP plan, excuse me, an individual educational plan. Uh, he was jittery in class. He was a very energetic kid um, at the end of the day. Um, but Darius, uh, he found himself not being able to pay attention, not because he didn't want to pay attention, um, but literally because he's like, hey, I grew up kids watch cartoons i watch sports center you know what i mean he was saying hey i i just want an opportunity to express myself in a way in my classroom that right now it's just not tailored for me to express it um and so at one point they were taking away recess from him and it's something that he was asking i was he was literally asking as a as a black student like hey i want more recess you know but they were not giving and meeting his needs and so eventually an administrator realized that he did, he needed that adjustment and then he's now been taken off the IE, IEP plan just based off of getting extra recess and physical activity. And uh, it's a great, it's a great understanding in another, just a quick two minute video of just showing how physical ac activity um, recess should be a very um, important cornerstone of, of working with our schools and then giving them and meeting their needs, especially um, communities that are, are experiencing these disparities. And so when we talk about punishment, um, when we talk about um, discipline. These are the questions that um, I may ask an educator or even ask myself, my school community. It, it, it is, uh, what is your school community's beliefs about punishment and consequences? Um, do you believe that our punishment or the punishment that you're employing um, meets the needs of the student? Um, if physical activity can lead to healthier students, do you think that recess is a critical component um, of student functionality? You know, and I, and I kind of was thinking, um, how do we even see recess and physical activity in our own schools? You know, is it is it do we see it as something that can provide healing, uh, can provide personal connection amongst other students or amongst um, staff? You know, and it's really being able. Our beliefs do kind of creep into how we are tailoring these environments uh, for our youth, um, as as we know. Um, and so I think it's important. The questions matter because these are questions that allow our maybe our district personnel or allow maybe the higher ups to kind of just think about things on a youth level, um, you know. So, and I was sitting reflecting. It's kind of like you know, my teacher, no matter how bad I did in class, she didn't say, "Sterling, you can't go to lunch and eat." You know, automatically that would make the newspaper. You know, but we don't we don't nutritionally yeah, we're feeding our students also like they also need physical activity and play and motion and movement as a need to be met at that school environment as well and we're talking about why maybe the disparities look different depending on um depending on the student and depending on their makeup and their, and their environment in which they come from so any any thoughts on that as we pause and consider or, or suggestions things that hit your mind if not we can move on 
see Bob. Yeah, yeah. So, so one of the heard recently uh, from the Active Schools program, uh, Dr. Brian Dewenauer, who helps uh, work with that with the Active Schools um, over at Northern Colorado. He reiterated this point that, you know, shouldn't it be a right, right? Shouldn't physical activity be a right? Why, like you're saying, why is it even on the table? Why are, why do people realize that this is what people need? We need physical activity and by taking it away, we're, we're being detrimental, right? So this idea of physical activity as a right, as you're saying, comparing it to food, right? It's as essential as food. Why, why isn't that there? And so I'm glad that we have organizations like Karen Guidance, uh, active schools, uh, Northern Colorado's program, um, advocates around the nation that are helping people to to come to this understanding. Definitely. No, thank you. Thank you for that. That's a key part is, is our beliefs. Why why is this on the table is important. Yes. Thank you. So as we uh, move here, so recess, um, just kind of important. This is actually, pull this side actually from pre that we did a while ago, um, a couple of months ago. And just what is recess and what, what is exactly going on when it comes to that structure, so recess time is on a decline. Um, we understand that access to recess varies from state to state. Um, the language of recess and physical activity is undefined at times, which allows maybe students to either step up or, or not do anything because it is undefined. Um, unstructured play adds to further disciplinary measures, uh, meaning, and, and we can give or take with that, we maybe discuss why, why that's a thing. Um, using recess as a punitive punishment com is a common practice. It's something that an educator is going to tell me, Sterling, I've been doing this for 20 years and it works. And I'm like, yes, because you take food away from a child, are we thinking <laughs> that's going to get them to do something as well or or subject them to more damage, you know? And so what does working mean? Like, that goes back to our question. Like, what exactly um, do I want to come out of this consequence, out of this punishment? And, you know, what need am I really meeting? When, I, when I'm doing this. And so just lessons learned uh, when it comes to our communities in general, all right? Students who experience disparities such as low social, socioeconomic status, disabilities that are black and brown or come from black and brown communities have less, less access to recess during school. Um, girl, and, and let's, well, we can stick on that stat in general. So if we understand that they have less access to recess in school, um, we also have to be aware that we know I didn't add in like the benefits of physical activity because I kind of felt as a as a cohort, we we know the benefits of physical activity and what it brings both mentally, physically, social, uh, psychosocially um, and, and the opportunities that it brings um, for us as we develop, as we develop into adults and, and maybe as our children are developing to, you know, um, adults or young adults as well. So when we're taking away um, recess, what are we really doing to our youth? You know, when, when we take away recess and we know that a, it's a structure for them, not only to exert physical energy, um, but it allows us to develop these psychosocial skill sets, not only for the black and brown students, but for, our, you know, our, their counterparts. What are we doing to them in their development into our communities? You know, and so I, I'm, I looked at this framework definitely in, in a public health big scale, um, as far as like the, the unintended consequences that occur um, when we take away recess. Um, you know, just some stats here, you know, it says that about 45% of students are on average, 50% of students are missing out on recess um, and, and when tracked by race, black and Latino students are less likely to have recess just in general, just like that's not even an option for them, you know, depending on the school setting that they're in. Um, you know, and so I think it's super important when we work with our youth and we talk about like the traumas and despairs that's going on, like why maybe marriage even more in the black and brown communities. But we understand, you know, 73 percent of the physical activity that they're going to get throughout the week happens in a school building or in a school community. You know, and if we take that away from them, take that away from them, what are we really doing to them physically, mentally, emotionally and psychosocially you know, in those moments? Sterling, can I jump in? Yes, please. Um, one of the conversations that Sterling and I had recently with a um, funded grantee through the um, Healthy Communities in New York, um, they were talking about um, if there were any specific um, physical activity and recess advocates that... Um, specifically help schools or districts do kind of not like focus groups, but almost like focus groups with parents and children 
of like, you know, immigrants, migrants, even undocumented, you know, families on how kids play. Because if you have a group of students that are from Africa that are new to this country, they don't know the games that students play at recess necessarily. And so, you know, we had a conversation with them about like, yeah, how do you create also opportunities that are culturally relevant and responsive to students that actually like weren't born here and um, see people playing and being physically active in a way that they recognize um, and can participate and feel a sense of belonging. So it's kind of like another layer on it that um, is really fascinating. It's the same with food, right? If students don't recognize the food at lunch, um, they might not want to eat it. And if they don't recognize the games that are being played, then they might not want to play it. So. No, this is a great point. And, e and even leveraging um, culture, you know, leveraging, um, you know, I'm in a community where we didn't have a lot of Latino students, but we had an influx when I was in third grade. But I'm telling you, when we had the influx, y'all, they literally, um, because we started playing soccer more. And that's then that was a sport that we, we've had before, right? But because we had the influx, it was something that we actually cared about because we had more students that were playing soccer. So they actually they invested into big soccer goals for us just because we transitioned away from the basketball, the football, into a sport in which um we were learning about a culture and able to have that conversation and able to break barriers just based off of that. Um and so I just to Jess's point, just being able to talk about play and the uniqueness of that sport, um, how it breaks those cultural barriers. And so uh, or disparities as well. Um, so we look at girls and we know a little bit um, about the population of girls that it says here in this quote, 1.3 um, million fewer opportunities to play high school sports than boys have. Um, it, there's a there's a survey uh, from uh, Gen Youth in the State of Student, which is a physical activity survey. And they, they surveyed, um, I believe 700 students in this survey, uh, but girls in the survey were less likely to be happy with how active they currently were. You know, um, but and also we look at disparity. Well, we see that because they're not given as many opportunities or maybe is our play like, like is recess as a school community? Is it set up um, or, or is it inclusive enough that our young women and young girls feel like this and is something that they want to be involved in, you know, um, and whatever that structure might look like within our school building. So I think that's key when we talk about inclusion. And so we talk about disabilities as well. Students with learning and physical disabilities are often restricted from recess are or or less likely to participate with the general class. Um, and there's disparities within that just kind of um, category of students as well. Um, so in, in the narrative is that there are more students of color that are in um, adequate, that, that are in special ed classes. Um, but what we understand is that they're less likely to get their needs met with special education services. Um, and so there's this kind of double, this, this, this very narrative that's going on within that community that gets them in these special education classes, but their needs are still not met. Um, and I kind of see what, how can we add in? Most times, some schools are pulling away recess so they can employ them with other skill sets that they need to learn um, to catch up with academics. But how do we use sports? How do we use games? How do we use challenges? How do we use physical activity um, to work within these populations that are they're restricted within their school communities and also they're restricted within their school environments or their, their home environments as well. Um, and so taking into account all these disparities, these are things that we might be familiar with, uh, but have to kind of keep it on our, our, our front, our frontal cortex when we're planning, when we're doing, developing policies, um, when we're engaging with youth. And I want to mention um, there is uh, the Institute for Sports and Social Justice. Um, their founder is Richard Lapchick. Um, who's kind of like, he's kind of known like the social conscious of like sports, professional sports. I um, mean, and, and therein, uh, he is a professor at the University of Central Florida, but they have a series called Invisible Women in Sport, um, where it's amazing. Like, you know, um, and they bring in just different backgrounds of women who are doing well in sports field and, and just sports backgrounds. Um, and they have a podcast and they have a series. Um, but I, I bring it as a point, that could be something that we as who are in the education field or are health educators or um, coaches could be showing or presenting a resource to girls as well. Let them know that there are people that are in this field um, that you just 
you might not even see represented within your own community, but they're there. They're they're out there. They're active. Um, and, and this could also maybe allow more engagement and more pull into working with um, with with that specific population. So as a quote, um, just kind of as we ponder those thoughts. Um, so Isabel uh, Wilkerson, she's an author and a journalist. Uh, she's made one of her most major books that people might know is called Cast. Um, and she has some other books as well. Um, but she says, consider biases or stereotypes as an automatic unconscious expectation based on what the individual or group looks like or has historically been assigned to. Former from millions of images, dialogues, and lack of in-depth conversations. All right. And I added this just because when we talk about a lot of this work, when it talks about like equitable practices and like why are we taking away recess, I think has to deal with maybe the, the unconscious biases that we have, um, especially as our teachers maybe day to day that are working with students. And we all are should be aware of our biases. Um, me as a um, me, myself, I'm aware of the biases that I bring into the room and, and I'm aware of my own space and being able to say, hey, I understand that actually a bias is, is biases are, are a natural thing that is given to us to protect us as as human creatures. Um, and so, but also I'm aware that our biases creep in and they, and they cover a blind, they blind me at times. And so how am I able to clean up those biases to provide maybe students, um, an environment that is safer, um, that is, that, that can challenge them, that can engage them, that is healthy for them. Um, and so, I feel like as educators or those who are working within the field in general, um, every day we have to look at our biases or our stereotypes and how they're making up even our way of disciplining uh, or, or our way of creating, um, you know, uh, the, these conversations that could be leading to, hey, you did wrong. You know, how are we even, cre how are we even creating that environment um, and not <laughs> creating these unintended consequences? You know, I did a survey on Instagram when we first said we we're going to do the series and I asked how many people, like, I like, asked pretty much like the friend group, um, who all got their recess taken away. And like, it was like 80%. And it's probably more, you know, and and, and it's not because my teacher was from a, a white dominant system or a probably like I had a black teacher who took away recess in kindergarten, you know, but that still affects me. That's still like, that is something I remember. And it doesn't affect me. I don't have trauma from it, but I'm aware like, wow, I was that was some injustices that occurred to me in kindergarten because I didn't color my fish purple you know she shouldn't have took away recess from me for that and that was a whole thing y'all and the, the end of the story is my dad printed out 50 pages of uh, purple colored fishes and told me to give it to the teacher so at least I learned that my father like he was gonna stick up for me so that was a lesson learned right but just being able to check our biases especially when we're working with you so equitable practices on um, these things that we were well aware of um, I want you to think as you're reading these notes, there's a there's a book called um, In My Grandmother's Hands. And there's and the author just shares that um, he states that inequality like racism is reflected through um, psychological center approaches, um, especially within black communities, experiencing the responses of uh, fight, flight or freeze in a in a rate that's very disproportionate than other demographics. Um, you know, the constant interactions. Uh, with the extreme emotions present causes these chemical changes and increase the risk of negative health outcomes. All right. With that understanding, though, um, racism or trauma or, you know, all these disparities that we're facing, it starts in, with the physical body, you know. And so without healing the physical body or without acknowledging like that trauma or those chemical disparities within my bones, um, I'm not able to deal with myself emotionally or psychosocially. And so I think it's an interesting angle to deal with something like DEI um, from the inner an anatomical body outwards. You know, and I don't know if that's an approach that has been done, but I think being able to talk about, you know, hey, we are, you know, we are um, inclusive um, because we recognize that the physical body is damaged due to bad and malpractice that isn't culturally responsive. You know, and so as an angle, as as I'm reading that book, and I, I think I, I would tell anyone that like wants to just learn more about, you know, DEI or or maybe trauma or racism and how to deal with it. Um, I, I loved his angle of just saying that it is something that is it's a physical response um, due to just the excess amount of 
uh, of fleeing or, or, or stress or anger. Um, but how do we deal with that? How can our school communities, right? How can our school communities help deal with that, those issues that are something that's internal that we see? And so we know that physical activity is voted <laughs> a student's favorite class 80% of the time. Like if you ask, ask any kid, ask my nephew who is, you know, five years old, what his favorite part of the day was, it was recess. He didn't know what he learned that day, but he knew he got to run around for 20 minutes. All right. But we also understand when poll principles also state that recess and physical activity has a positive impact on academic success as well. And action for healthy kids actually polled everyone. And so we always got to go back to the why. Like, why is recess taken away from you? You know, why do you feel like it's a needed thing or, or why do you feel like it actually meets the need of your kid? And so being culturally responsive methods, um, interventions when providing consequences for actions. And so um, that last point, it really just goes back to, you know, I know a lot of teachers are saying, hey, Sterling, we, we're taking away recess right now because we want we want our, our kids to understand like there's consequences in this world. Like that's kind of what I've heard before. There's consequences or, you know, there are repercussions for your actions. This is true. But I always kind of reflect to the educator that, um, that you know, are you, do you really want your youth to deal with the, the, the harshness of the consequences on, in their school community as well as, you know, their home environment as well? If, they're, if, if you're in, a, if you're in a, a, a population of kids that are at risk um, or, or who could be at risk, you know, so I know that you want your, your laws and your policies to represent the real world. But do you even do you feel like the real world is equitable to kids uh, that you're working with? And so these are just the thoughts and conversations. A lot of this stuff of uh, the change has to go back just to the why. Um, so just maybe some prevention here as alternatives. Um, and I mentioned like I looked at this in the public health thought process. And so I can't really talk this without prevention work, you know, without actually saying we're going to take some steps. Um, before we, we have consequences. Um, and so mastering the classroom equation, adding physical activity during classroom instruction takes much takes as much time as disciplining or calming the energetic student. Um, so that transition period um, as well. But I know a lot of our educators are just saying, hey, I just want to calm this child down. You know, they always run around in class, things of that nature. But adding in physical activity or adding in that 10 minute break might be um, your key. To, to lock in more recess within your school. Um, catching students in the act of doing good, um, using positive messaging and affirmation of skills learned. Um, so PlayWorks, as you all are probably familiar with PlayWorks for sure, um, they actually did a study in which, um, and I guess as far as tracking and measuring if PlayWorks was beneficial, uh, they measured how many times the teacher or the coach was using positive messaging and affirmation to the students. Um, and so, and a lot of educators are maybe trying to figure out like, how do I even assess that? Well, you assess that if the positive message is working by like allowing them to have recess and seeing in that unstructured time, like what are they saying to each other? What are they saying to each other while they're playing that game or doing that challenge? Um, and to me, that's kind of a better way of assessing if that's something that the kid or the student is actually learning. Um, and you mentioned just decreased boredom and intrusive behavior. Um, I, I really would say using, you know, the things like from an occupational therapist standpoint, um, they have skills and games and challenges that we say are for kids with autism or kids with like special needs. But like, you know, depending on your mess up, you could have been that person assigned as someone with a special need in certain communities. You know, so I said, I said, I feel like everyone benefits, you know, from activities um, when it comes to like motor skill learning or motor skill development. I am mean, adding that into the classroom. And so those are things that, you know, within your own school community, you kind of maybe have to figure out funding of do we do we do we have money for a PlayWorks coach or do we have money for a, a traveling occupational therapist to come here once a week and, and do games and challenges and things of that nature. But and then they a well-designed classroom instruction that incorporates play and physical activity can increase motor skills and skills to resolve conflict resolution. And at the end of the day, I think. That is the prevention of the discipline. If we if we teach some conflict resolution, being able, I feel like the extreme is taking away a recess. That is like the extreme. That is like unheard of. You know that that's how I, I feel like the culture should go towards. Um, if we're teaching things like conflict resolution, and on here I, I just put you know using music or, or even starting your class once you do get them to a point where um, they understand their goal as a classroom or as a school, 
you can do things like groundedness activities or mindfulness moments, um, you know, as a class. Or I know now it's a big push for yoga within schools and, and classroom settings. Um, but you all, I would love to hear your thoughts as far as like that as a prevention. And I, I got a few more slides on prevention as well. But any thoughts come to your mind? Like, is it doable? Is this like too transformative? Like, is it is it something that schools are using that you all know um, in your work as prevention? I think one of the points that you made that I want to reiterate is like this idea of withholding physical activity. The, the students who are, uh, in quotes, misbehaving because they're trying to move um, as their nature, right? We're not talking about subgroups. We're talking about kids, nature, move. And because their nature is trying to come out and we're trying to conform them to these desks and these rows and this attention for longer periods of time than they're um, developmentally able, then we're punishing them by taking away the thing that they then need because we force them into these unnatural situations. So it, it, it is a little a weird, ironic thing that happens is because we as adults are putting them in a situation where they can't move, they get misbehaved uh, in an outcome, as an outcome. And then we as adults withhold the very thing that caused them uh, the lack of now we're going to give them this physical activity. Now we take that away as well. And so I, I, I think your point again is it's not the, it's not the kid, it's us as adults who control environments. How are we setting them up to be successful so that we can prevent um, what we're seeing as misbehavior or embrace the student's nature and, and run with it? How do we take advantage of the desire and the need to be physically active in spaces of learning and then uh, then to encourage physical activity when recess is happening. Because we have to remember too, right? Recess isn't synonymous with physical activity, right? It's it's a, a lot of times it's an option. Um, so how can we incorporate it in spaces where uh, it's part of the environment, right? So we're increasing that physical activity by doing it um, in, in the example of brain energizers and yoga in the classroom, whatever the case may be. So yeah, I, I really appreciate you driving home this idea that it's, it's not the kids, um, it's not their fault. And so be, uh, we need to, as adults, you know, respond with our emotions, even though sometimes it's frustrating when kids are, uh, in quotes, misbehaving. But we have to rethink uh, about what's happening there and, and why it's happening and maybe take some of that ownership. So I appreciate that, Sterling. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Thank you for that, Simmons. I think it's important. <laughs> you know, policies don't mean it's, it's good policy just because you have a policy, you know, or like you said, um, creating environments that might be unstructured or or set them up for failure, quote unquote, where when we're sitting our youth into a 90 minute class or a two hour class setting without any breaks, any physical activity, any opportunity to see the sun, you know, it's interesting because we had COVID, right, as a thing that happened to our, our communities and our, especially our school communities. And a lot of parents, you know, were begging their kids to do something with physical activity, you know, and their kid might've wanted to do that as well. Now we got them back into the classroom setting and, we might have forgotten to add those things that they need. They need those things. And so I thank you for clearing up that even the point of recess is something that is just unclear. And, it, and, it, um, and we'll talk about some, we'll show some policies here as well, where at a state level, like we, we're, we're recommending, highly recommending and, and mandating that recess is a thing within these school communities. Cool. So alternatives, this just goes deeper into like in the classroom, animal stretches, you know, name stretches, um, four stations every corner. So, you know, it was a rainy day here in South Carolina and I automatically, I was like, wow. And I'm doing a webinar on recess. And like, these kids don't even have recess today. You know, so I wonder in their, in their school setting, do they have an alternative for, you know, recess and physical activity when it's not raining uh, or um, when it is raining, excuse me. Um, so being able to do four stations every corner where there's a different physical activity from push-ups to, you know, uh, jumping jacks or whatever it might be that you you incorporated. Simon says maybe a good one. And then they said partner games. And so, you know, now like as adults now, when we're doing to trainings and facilitations, there, there is a lot of partner one-on-one -on -one at times when we're working through things. And so being able to add that with sensory educational activity games, and those are things, of course, you do a quick Google, you can find a lot of good stuff from maybe occupational therapists, like I mentioned, or those um, who are maybe working with youth who are autistic or on the spectrum. Those are good games for anyone to use, I feel like. And then just the power of pause, you know, like we mentioned earlier, implementing mindfulness practices after or before physical activity. You know, definitely want to call like someone like um organization like Erica's Lighthouse. 
uh, which is a great nonprofit that have free turnkey curriculums um, that teachers can use. And they actually have something, um, they called it, I think it's called Refresher Mindfulness now. And they have this wheel that you can click and it'll spin and it'll fall on either a physical activity, a mindfulness moment or, or another activity. And then the students get to act it out. You know, so just another thing that that our educators or, um, you know, CBO, community-based organizations can use with students to create environments in which, yes, discipline happens when we're working with youth, but also we're disciplined in understanding that we're building relationships and building, building positive habits, healthy habits for those youth. So more just prevention as an alternative, and I say as an alternative, maybe even um, ways in which we're not taking away recess is probably the best way to say this. Um, and so recess provided twice a day or, or increments of four 15 minute recess breaks. I believe in Illinois, uh, they have that in which they have these increments of four 15 minute recess breaks. Um, there's a study that came out recently in which they say adults should be moving around you know, every 30 minutes. Um, and so I know a lot of us, we this is our work is on this laptop and our backs is this way. And But imagine our youth as well, um, you know, them having every 30 minutes of, of curriculum, they may be able to move around or do an activity which has them moving around. Um, extended recess could be a thing for your community and your school community. Physical activity as an incentive to academic achievement in addition to recess. All right. You know, and so um, that could look very different depending on where you're at. But, you know, I, I think back to when I was in middle school, we had things called uh, early bird, which was a horrible idea to 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 bring six and seven graders into the school at seven o'clock and teach them algebra. It was a horrible idea. I had a, it was a horrible, but they probably said to add physical activity in there to help start my day. You know, and they put us in there because we were like the, the honor students and all that stuff. But like we didn't learn and we get their purpose. But maybe they would have added physical activity. Maybe they would have brought in a coach um, uh, that allows to play some games that morning, how that would affect our behavior as a as a group or a cohort. Um, I mentioned Playworks and they have uh, peer or junior coaches. Um, but that might be something that school communities can tailor for themselves as far as curating peer or junior coaches or or youth led. Um, we talk about youth led um, activities as well within their school. Um, I think that's important, even with like if you're in a district that's small enough or capable enough, you know, working with students who maybe are seniors who could have late arrival, you know, and working with students who are or in a, a primary level and bringing them in and teach them how to work with youth as an opportunity for 15, 20 minutes. You know, these are things that I think we kind of have to be creative and innovative, um, but these are ideas that, that we just kind of throw out there and see if it works for your community. Um, partnerships with school resource uh, resources within that building. So, um, and this is something that I would like to even work through mentally is what that looks like. You know, so I don't want, I know that physical activity is important for that youth, um, but also I understand that academically they might not have made, reached that achievement or they've been acting out in class in which, you know, um, as deterred other students. So where else do I send them? You know, and so I'm thinking, you know, do we have the opportunity to send them to school resources like the library assistant or a pantry organizing? Um, you know, um, and the goal isn't to say, hey, this is a this is when you mess up, like you go to these people because they're in they're in these jobs that that you know aren't as important. I don't think that's our goal of angling it. I think it's being able to keep that student active involved in build school connectivity, which I know is a big push right now. I think that allows them to build that without cornering them out and making them feel like, man, you just throwing me in the corner because I'm messing up. Or really I needed a, I needed my need to be met, um, but I wasn't, you weren't able to provide that for me. So you took away my recess and my need still isn't met. But if we have these relationships and we were talking about my, how that conversa conversation may even happen within your school. Um, I looked at an organization, it's, a, it's an organization called Grassroots Health, uh, and they advance health equity in cities using sports uh, to reimagine health education in schools. And what they do is they mobilize NCAA athletes to do so. And so within that organization, um, they, they teach these student athletes how to work with youth, and they, they work mostly with middle schoolers um, in employing activities, challenges, um, and, and really a uh, teaching them how to be stewards of physical activity or maybe their recess environment. And so I thought it was a pretty unique organization, along with um, Gen Youth, which have a uh, root for her curriculum for middle school girls. And it's kind of similar, if you're familiar with like the Dove Self-Esteem Project, it really talks to young girls about um, developing their self-esteem, developing um, 
what they want to see within their own sport. Um, and then it has a full on curriculum that, that just allows them to develop, develop these positive affirmations that allows them just to see that, hey, there are there is a space for you um, in this field of sports, games, physical activity. And so those are two organizations that um, that I think about when it comes to just developing more prevention. Oh, excuse me. Let's see. All right. WISC, our favorite framework, and this is something that like, you know, I see the smiles, you know, because it's something we're still, that we work with every day and when it comes to working within our school communities. And so just WISC as a model, and then I use the the newer, I guess the newer model, I would say, of the whole school, whole child, whole community approach. Um, really, uh, Sean Slade, uh, who is amazing and one of the, I would say, creators along with the CDC, and he was with, um, I believe he was with ASCDS as a uh, organization with the whole child initiative. They came together, of course, for WISC. Um, but he added the piece, the piece of culture and leadership. Um, and he has a quote that says, culture eats strategy. You know, and I think that's a, I mean, that's simple phrase, a simple, but I think it's important. You know, being able to have this approach um, frames child development as a web of layers of support that includes community, family involvement, physical environments, physical health, education, social, emotional climates, and services that enhances the possibilities of of course, the components of the healthy, safe, engaged, supported, and challenged students. And so I really see this as our framework of creating more equitable approaches for our students. Um, WISC is one of those things I feel like has worked in a lot of communities because we are using the power of what is already there. You know, um, you know, my grandfather, grandfather's a pastor, and he always says in church, like, everything's in-house. You know, meaning like all the things that we need is here in our own community at times. And so when we use WISC, I feel like we are interacting with like what are who are the strong individuals or strong resources that care about physical health, physical environment, employee wellness, you know, social, emotional climate. I feel like all these things add in into like behaviors and add into making equitable outcomes of discipline as well. You know, and so if employees are showing positive messaging amongst each other because their their needs are being met um you know psychosocially emotionally physically then most and most likely our students are seeing that as well and it's reflecting out in the classroom amongst their peers um and that's kind of how we we hope that 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 goes and so whisk as a component of course we have blade the blaze approach which you know i do a quick pitch october 24th we're going to do a webinar on the blaze approach with um kevin larso out of ohio um and so but WISC, I feel like, allows us to create models in which um, students see the entire, the totality of like who truly cares at times. Um, I believe in the last slide I mentioned using, um, or I didn't add, I didn't, I didn't add using community resources, you know. And so an example is we have a local, it's a charter school, and they um, they use some of their funding to bring in an MMA fighter and an MMA like uh, uh, he has a he has a, a gym here in town. And so they don't have a, a playground yet because they're just forming, right? But they bring him in to develop and, and include physical activity within their school. Uh, you know, or you know, like I mentioned, bringing in high schoolers who are maybe athletes at their own school and bringing them in to, to elementary schools or middle schools as well as an opportunity to create more engagement under uh, over physical activity and recess as well. You know, and so I think, like I said, WISC is an opportunity to use the strength of your, the strengths of your community um, to employ uh, equitable outcomes, I believe. And so we understand like a lot of this stuff is like high level, like how do I even get the, the principal to understand or get the superintendent to understand that recess matters. And so, yeah, it's deeper than the components. That's why, you know, Sean Slade and their crew added the culture and leadership. A lot of times I feel like um, punishment and consequences are based off of just the culture of that school environment. You know, and so how we how are we able to change the culture or change the narrative when it comes to um, discipline is important, especially taking away recess is, is important. So. And just some statements as we as we close up here, um, statements and policies, you know, this is something that we worked on you know, a couple months ago as far as like and, and what it looks like to create statements and policies. But of course, I mean, Shape America has done a great job of creating that position on physical activity um, not being used as a punishment. And I'm gonna show just that brief blurb again. Uh, we got Arizona Department of Education. They wrote their um, statements. And then we're just talking about developing mission statements that include the intentionality of just DEI. And I didn't, I, you know what? 
I couldn't find one that actually talks specifically to like physical activity or recess, but that could be something that we just start creating examples of like, what does that look like for um, educators? You all might be familiar with some um, right now as well. And so just shape, you know, I would love, because we have, you know, Professor Knipe here, but I would love maybe your thoughts on just how does this form? I know that um, you actually had someone, someone presented recently um, that I saw uh, the presentation on the position statement and both uh, appropriate versus not appropriate. Um, and so Shape America is a really a great resource when it comes to learning more about this, but I would love to hear your insight. Um, Professor Knife, if you're here, if you just got some thoughts on this. Yeah, so the, the position speaks both to utilizing physical activity as punishment. So when we think about drop and give me 20 or give me a lap, um, and then also the, the aspect that we're talking about today, the withholding. I think one of the other models that needs to be addressed here is when we're trying to convince people to operate within these structures, these models, WISP being kind of the big picture and then embedded into that, uh, a smaller portion could be the CISPAP model, right? The comprehensive school physical activity programs uh, is a great way to get people to start to conceptualize, okay, how do we put this into action? What are the different components and how do they fit together, right? So I think one of the things that we worked on in our in our field is we had like the let's move active schools, right? With Michelle Obama and it comes out and everyone's like, yes, we need to help the inactive schools, but there was so much going on it was hard to make sense of it. And I think sometimes we need to, to focus. And I think comprehensive school physical activity programs help us to do that, right? Pretty basic structure, uh, the different components with, um, you know, before and after schools. And then again, I think one of the major points that we need to nail home with this is in that CISPAP model, physical education, right? Physical educators are those champions. They should be the number one champions. If they're on this call, they're listening, right? They you need to activate yourself as the ambassador for your students on your campus, both for the withholding part and the use as punishment. Uh, Cause we know that happens in our classes with our teachers. We need to make sure we call them out and hold up best practice and call out inappropriate practice, but we need to find opportunities to uh, expand. Uh, the, the other classroom teachers that we work with our coaches, right? Are these things being reinforced in those areas? But uh, so again, two points here. The, the CISPAP may be a little bit tighter and, and more pointed for some of our champions to kind of embrace with WISP kind of being this bigger picture and then CISPAP being a little more direct. A lot of great research and resources coming out through active schools uh, around this. Um, so you're seeing a lot of publications coming out uh, the last couple of months, boom, publishing, publishing, publishing. So uh, some great resources there. And then again, activating our physical educators at the center of that CISPAP model uh, with physical education being the core, right? We talk about, are, are they uh, knowing how to be active together at recess? Are we encouraging that? What should it look like to be socially responsible in those spaces? What are some activities that are going to get them high levels of physical activity? We need to be calling on our physical educators to own that uh, as the ambassadors, the champions in their schools for physical activity and for their students. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much. I couldn't say it any better than what I could have said at all. So, I think going and referring to Shape America and the tools that they have, their document is amazing. Like you can really sit there and learn a lot as far as as a starting point, uh, even what to say or what not to say in those moments. And so thank you all for the resource. And like you mentioned, like in the last couple of weeks, I've just been seeing just new articles of new articles coming out specific to this, this topic and conversation. Um, so just as more policies as we in here, you know, Arizona and their policy statement there, um, recess as a requirement, um, and, you know, it says here, school district and charter schools shall provide at least two recess periods um, during school day uh, for pupils in kindergarten and programs in grades one to five. Um, that is amazing. Like I mentioned, in Illinois, they're having, they have four increments of 15 minute recess or physical activity breaks. Um, so just being able to reimagine what school looks like is kind of like our, our, our thought process here. And then just DEI statements. And so I pulled this from public schools uh, of Northern California. Um, and in this statement, of course, they just say our mission and theory of action describe our belief in transformative power of education to play a critical role in combating systemic racism and all forms of oppression. And we know that we can't succeed. And we know that we can't succeed in that in any perceived successes would rank um, successes will ring hollow without any active and explicit commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, we will hold ourselves to accountable to the continuous, oh, that's great, to continuous um, learning and improvement 
as we work together to implement our um, our vision. And so, you know, I think it's very important as we are working in this field. And it really is like, what do we consider education? Like, is when we say education, are we even thinking that recess is an education opportunity for our students? You know, and so that's important. You know, because I'm thinking, hey, specifically, if I'm a physical education teacher or, you know, someone that truly cares about using sports or games or challenges, you know, how are we defining education within our, our system is important as well to consider. Um, and so as we close, you saw the last quote here. And so I'm always just want to reflect and think, but kids that are loved at home come to school to learn. All right. Kids that aren't come to school to be loved. You know, and it's a very transformative statement as far as like, are our schools meeting the needs of the of the youth that are coming within their building? Um, you know, and so, and, and those needs that are being met, uh, if they are being met at home, then they're able to learn um, in a fuller way at your school building. But if they're not being met at home, then it's up to our school communities, as we all know, to kind of step in and fill these gaps um, of disparities that's going on within um, multiple demographics within our community. And so, you know, as a closing, I really appreciate uh, you all hopping on here and just kind of having this dialogue, this conversation. I hope, honestly, this is, this is something that's not like even a series. This is something that we just continue to build off of, um, especially for our educators. And so, you know, I mentioned to Professor Knight that I hope that we can do a call, you know, together pretty soon and kind of just tailor conversations around this because um, I know our educators are asking for it on multiple levels. And so I appreciate you all, appreciate you all for spending your time with us um, this afternoon and so if there's any questions or closing thoughts or reflections, um, please feel please feel free to share it. Um, but we will have this posted on YouTube and maybe post clips um, on our different platforms as well. And like you said, um, hope to grow this. I think a big part of what kept running through my mind a little bit is just the need for the professional development for classroom teachers as it relates to this, which yes, it's super simple and doesn't seem like it would be too complicated, but I think getting that PD time to them is not an easy thing because you then need that administrator buy-in or district level buy-in that of course is going to look different at every state. They have sometimes all of their required professional development here in Kentucky is laid out for them. Um, and this wouldn't be a, a hot topic to include. So I think there's a little bit of, um, advocacy that needs to go into that. And then obviously reaching pre-service, getting them before they get in that building um, is huge too. We have, there's, and there's places that do that, but um, I think that's just a huge thing to move the needle and, and do this. Cause I, it, again, it, it's going to vary everywhere, but even, you know, within a state that it differs each um, by each district, what, what students receive. Like, I mean, I'm lucky my district that my kids go to they get two recesses a day that is very uncommon especially um, in our state so I think it's just seeing that showing others and then highlighting that as well highlighting those successes to say this district did it then why couldn't a neighboring or anyone else in the state so that could be a another point to um to advocate with definitely Stephanie I, I completely agree as how do we get to those classroom teachers um, and it's challenging, right? Because we already have a packed bill on most of those professional development days. Uh, for some of the teachers, you can advocate to have even just like the five minute, right? So instead of advocating for maybe a full session at the beginning, one of the things that I was successful with was just offering brain energizers for the professional development. So instead of it being a PD, like, hey, like just give me five minutes to, to get everyone up and moving, right? Uh, but then it gives you this opportunity to just to slide in those little plugs, like, hey, couldn't you use this with your students, right? And so it might be a, a small way, like you mentioned advocacy, it might be just like a small little seed plant that uh, can then come to fruition later on. And for, for my experience, that was successful. We got to the point where we did a book study over the summer. Um, they read a book called The Kinesthetic Classroom, and it really helped them understand what is really going on? What can we do to take advantage of kinesthetic learning? And uh, it flourished, it flourished really well. Uh, and I hopefully, like to your point about our future professionals, that hopefully I can bring that to my students to encourage them to be those champions when they go out right there. They instruct the class, but they're as physical educators, when we define that that role, hopefully it's way broader than just the instruction they give during that four five, six, seven classes a day. Yeah, we have an amazing teacher uh, in Kentucky that, you know, she did um, she did 
or uh, energizers, whatever, you know, you want to refer to them as at staff meetings. And that was part of the agenda. She got on the agenda and that's just a huge little buy-in and it gives them examples and resources. Yeah. I mean that you're right. Starting simple is, is always the way to go. Um, but I just think there's a lot to it when it comes to, I don't know, changing mindsets, obviously it takes a lot longer. There's a definitely, uh, like you're saying, it takes time and systems, right? We need to change systems. So a quick plug to Karen guidance, yeah. uh, the system simulation, if you haven't gotten a chance to see it, I highly recommend going through the system. Uh, she simulation. probably knows it too well. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, yes. For anyone who's watching, um, reach out to Karen Guidance to learn more about that because this is a long-term process, right? And it might be those small seeds that come to fruition later, way down the road. Um, but I know that people that jump on this care about this and are willing to put in the work. It, but it gives you a, a way of thinking and some some system, uh, some steps to start navigating through the policies and the, the structures and start working with those key stakeholders to, to move any initiative fo forward. Uh, in this case, how do we make sure that students get their right full place to physical activity? So uh, yeah, quick flow. Perfect, perfect. I appreciate appreciate both of you, um, your expertise and you know, your knowledge and just your will to continue to learn and, and us continue to learn as far as employing these resources for educators and you know I was thinking even I know Shape America's bring they bring in you know uh, students and so how are we engaging with our, our, our soon to be coaches and educators and teaching them a whole new culture is is important to the sustainability of, of these practices and these policies and so um, thank you all for your time and, and just sharing with us and uh, we look forward to to tailoring another call specific to this topic take care everyone thank you thanks.